Hello? Oh, okay. There we are. <laughs> So, ladies and gentlemen, I know we're, uh, we're slave driving you this morning and pushing really, really hard. Um, <laughs> we do have the two speakers online already, so we're going to go ahead and get this panel started as well. Uh, so, if you could return to your seats and we can get ready for what I hope is going to be another uh, wonderful panel. Um, so, again, first panel of the day, welcome. Uh, from my perspective, uh, we, we're talking about a, a ton of really strategically important issues across the two days of these conferences. But if I have to really focus on one that I think has a broad impact across the region, this panel might be it. Um, just how significant uh, is it when we think about maritime security and maritime law in East Asia? Well, pretty much every other major security issue or any other strategic issue that we talk about in the region, whether it's the South China Sea, whether it's the East China Sea, Taiwan, as Dr. Mastro, uh, I think, so eloquently uh, explained, uh, great power competition, energy security, economic security, humanitarian and disaster relief, the rules-based order, even North Korea. These are all either entirely maritime security issues or contain maritime components that are essential to their natures. Indeed, just consider how much of the defense-related news in East Asia includes some operational or tactical maritime component. We have Taiwan Strait transits. We have fear of naval blockades and choke points. We have nuclear-powered submarines and AUKUS. We have maritime militias, freedom of navigation operations or FONOPS. We have island disputes, illegal, unreported, and unregulated unre fishing, maritime piracy, and, and on and on and on. Indeed, at the heart of any Indo-Pacific strategy is a two oceans view of Asia, right? One connected by the sea lines of communications or slocks running from the Middle East across the Indian Ocean through the Straits of Malacca into the South China Sea and the Pacific Ocean and into the East Asian energy markets. Indeed, these slocks, I think, sit at the heart of strategic Asia like arteries in a global economy carrying both the promise of economic health on the one hand and the danger of an economic heart attack on the other. Uh, states across the region know this, of course, and have prioritized their militaries and their development uh, and are restructuring in many instances accordingly, drawing down on land forces and prioritizing naval and air force development in, in their stead and investing in coastal defenses and area denial platforms. Now, along all side of this is maritime law, whether customary law or the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea or UNCLOS, as you'll hear referred to multiple times throughout the, the course of this presentation, which attempts at least to provide some sort of rule book for how to think about issues ranging from how to define an exclusive economic zone, how to determine what's a rock and what's an island, how these things relate to territorial claims, and other really critical factors related to state activities on the maritime global commons. So a really complex set of issues, how to make sense of it all. I, I can't say uh, that we'll answer everything today, but I can say that we'll get through a lot of it because we have an absolutely world-class group of experts here today to help us deal with some of these issues, to help us think about uh, some of these really, really thorny maritime security issues on the one hand and the interaction with maritime law. Um, I couldn't be more pleased than to welcome the panelists. I'm going to introduce everybody, but I'll say just off the front that one panelist wasn't able to make it today, Dr. Ju Feng. Uh, so please, I extend uh, um, his apologies to the group. Uh, unfortunately, his schedule didn't allow him to attend. But in his place, we have four excellent speakers who can touch not only on these big, broad issues, but can do so with specific lens and specific expertise that will allow us actually to kind of create a mosaic of, of regional, sub-regional, um, issue areas, uh, strategic areas, all that will allow us to have a greater dive into what we mean when we talk about maritime security and maritime law. So I'll start in no particular order. Darshana Barao is a, a fellow at the South Asia program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, where she directs the Indian Ocean Institute. Yurika Ishii is an associate professor at the National Defense Academy of Japan, where she's in charge of law of the sea and public international law courses. John Odom from the George C. Marshall Center uh, in Garmisch, Germany. Welcome, John. Uh, and James Batillier, the distinguished fellow with the McDonald Laurier Institute and a former special advisor for policy at Maritime Forces Pacific, MARPAC, the Canadian Navy formation on the West Coast. 
So I've asked everybody to prepare some scripted remarks uh, between five, 10 minutes to hear your thoughts. And then what we'll do is follow the models that we've had before, open for questions and answers. I'll key up some questions to start with after the presentations, and we can ex explore uh, the breadth and depth of the, the um, experts that we have, their knowledge on these really important issues. James, will you kick us off? Thank you so much, Jeff. Uh, let me begin by thanking uh, the Foundation and the Institute for organizing this session. Uh, I think it's extraordinarily timely and important that we address many of the issues that are on the agenda for these uh, two days. And I'd also like to congratulate uh, the students that are present here because quite literally, and this is maybe a cliche, but the future is in your hands. And we desperately need uh, people with a detailed and informed uh, knowledge of the dimensions of the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, this is critical for our public health, uh, our political well-being, uh, and our future. I was elegantly preempted uh, by uh, Dr. Mastro. I began to feel like someone on an ice pack drifting into the Gulf Stream uh, as I saw all my formal comments begin to be eroded, uh, and uh, that process was uh, rapidly accelerated by Jeff's fine uh, introduction. But let me spend the next uh, five or eight minutes uh, covering what I consider to be some of the key elements that may underlie this uh, maritime discussion uh, this morning. Firstly, and self-evidently, geography. Uh, the Indo-Pacific is the quintessential maritime realm in the world. And its immensity and its complexity are issues that we need to bear very much in mind when we discourse about what may happen in the region. We need to realize that uh, the Pacific Ocean uh, is now linked inextricably by virtue, as Jeff has just suggested, of sea lines of communication to the Indian Ocean. We ha now have a new lineup of players, of which more in a moment. And that if there is a conflict, it will almost certainly be, in the initial stages at least, at sea. We also need to realize that if we look at the approaches to the Asian coast, what we see are, and many of you will be aware of these terms, the first and second island chains. When you're in Beijing and you're looking out at the Pacific, what you see is a series of arcuate island lines which run down from Japan through the Philippines and on to Papua New Guinea, the first island chain. And the key to that, the hinge of fate, to use Churchill's term, is Taiwan. The criticality of Taiwan in terms of the defense of China from the Chinese perspective is enormous. Uh, secondly, somewhat farther out is the second island chain. Somewhat less defined, but they're nonetheless in approaches to China. And what the Chinese have done is to pursue a weaker naval power strategy. What I'm about to tell you in a moment may seem to contradict the weaker term, but uh, the Beijing authorities have decided to focus on sea denial rather than sea control. Their objective, simply put, is that if there is a conflict with the United States, that uh, they will use all their resources, Chinese resources, to keep the United States Navy at arm's length from the Chinese coast either naval assets or a vast array of missiles. And there was a reference by Dr. Mastro to the Dongfang-21 Delta, a intermediate range missile designed to take out American carriers. So we must bear in mind the importance and the complexity of the geography of both maritime and terrestrial in approaches to the Asian shore. Next, let me talk quickly about numbers. In 1945, the United States Navy was 6,000 ships. Now it is 1 20th of that number, suffering from decades of budgetary disarmament. In 1986, uh, President Reagan and Secretary of the Navy Lehman wanted to have a 600-ship Navy. They never got close to that, and now it's 
probably about 290 ships in the United States Navy, and the Chinese Navy is significantly larger, numerically, and that's very, very important to bear in mind, numerically, not qualitatively, and not in terms of experience. The Chinese Navy, while new and remarkable, and in the first eight months of 2019, the Chinese commissioned more warships than the entire Canadian Navy. Think about that. And behind that, of course, is a colossal shipbuilding industry. 5,300 commercial ships, tankers, bulk carriers, and so on, compared with about 100 in the US registry. So what we see now is that uh, the largest navy on the face of the earth, the United States Navy, has been eclipsed. Now, one could argue, of course, that the Americans had other things to worry about in the Middle East and so forth. But what we see, and this leads to my third point, is that there is a robust and complex debate unfolding in Washington as to the future nature of the United States Navy. How will they build enough ships to match the Chinese Navy? And are there enough shipyards to build all of these ships and submarines? There aren't. In fact, the number of shipyards has declined dramatically over the years uh, in the United States. Is there a workforce capable of building these ships? And are there enough sailors to man these ships? So right now, there is a debate as to whether we should have a lot of large ships and a small number of small ships, or the other way around. Should the emphasis be on aircraft carriers or on submarines? What about support vessels? And remember, of course, and I would challenge Dr. Mastro on this point, she said how the United States could project power. Indeed, but if you're fighting a war over Taiwan at sea, you've got to move your ships from the Californian coast or Hawaii four or 5,000 miles to operate off Taiwan. It's a bit like getting in your Jetta and driving from here to Moscow at 30 miles an hour. So the Chinese, by comparison, have 110 miles to go to get to Taiwan. So the logistics, once again, it comes back to geography, the dictates of geography, the enormity of, of the region. So there's a full-blown debate as to force structure, the fleet balance, and of course, as a subset of that, there's a whole world. We're on the cusp of Star Wars in the sense that there's a whole world of autonomous, unmanned uh, vehicles, submarines, and the elements that fit in submarines. So what you'll have increasingly in the new defense budget for the United States Navy is more and more ships that are completely unmanned. They operate for weeks or months at a time off the Chinese coast, send back signals, or could potentially sink Chinese ships uh, all on their own. My fourth point, allies. Allies are absolutely critical. And this is a point that Dr. Mastro is making. Will the center hold? What will happen with Japan? What will happen with South Korea? What will happen with Australia? What will happen, dare I ask, with Canada if there is a naval conflict in and around Taiwan? It's not simply a question of do we fight or don't we fight, but if we do fight, what about logistics? Because in a full-blown naval battle within the space of an hour or two, your entire in inventory of missiles is fired and gone. And there you are in your Canadian frigate 5,000 miles from Vancouver, and you need to be resupplied. How? And this comes back to our colleague from yesterday who was uh, talking about Okinawa and, and resistance to basing them. bases. This is another critical issue. There's a reason why the Americans are in Japan, in South Korea, in Guam, increasingly in the Philippines once again, in Australia. This was the immutable lesson of World War II, that unless you're close to the Asian shore, you can't conduct warfare. And so the question is, how do you protect Guam with its long-range bombers, its ballistic missile submarines, its aircraft carriers visiting APRA? How do you protect them from Chinese missile attack? How do you resupply your ships? Putting missiles onto destroyers on the high seas is not easy. And this is one of the logistic realities. Uh, last point, and that's uh, China. 
the Chinese, uh, I think, uh, I would partly agree with what Dr. Mastro has said. I think that uh, Xi is a deeply ambitious uh, individual and has an intent to join the great trifecta of Mao and Deng in the sky. And reincorporating Taiwan will be critical to that everlasting uh, reputation. And so I think he is under some uh, pressure to, in fact, reincorporate. And the Belt and Road and the whole growth of the Chinese Navy are highly ahistoric in the Chinese experience. And the Belt and Road, with its maritime dimensions, leads China not only through the South China Sea, and that brings us to the whole question of maritime law, but into the Indian Ocean. And one of the really critical elements is the larger balance of power emerging in Asia with respect to the navies of the region, because we are now incorporating India, which has got a smaller navy, but nevertheless a nuclear navy, uh, and Australia, Japan, the United States. So we now have a relationship of navies increasingly dedicated to containing or eventually combating uh, China. So let me stop there. That's a quick tour of the horizon of some of the issues that I think are really critical in this discussion. Jim, that was masterful, uh, I think, introduction to some of the major issues uh, that are happening across the, the Asia-Pacific, the Indo-Pacific. That discussion of balance of power and the development of different naval kind of uh, nodes across the region I think is critical. But of course, one of the things that keeps balance of power in check is, is rule of law, right? International law and maritime law as <laughs> it's kind of superimposed over the region. Uh, what kind of controls, what kind of uh, institutions, what kind of opportunities exist there in order to prevent some of the conflict and in, in order to manage some of these security um, concerns that we have related to, to the region's fast growing maritime environment. John, I wonder if I can turn it over to you to maybe take that point on. Give us a, maybe a, a, a 101 introduction to maritime law in the region and, and maybe help us think through a little bit about maritime law and its application in, in the broader strategic environment. Uh, and, and, you know, love to hear your thoughts. Thanks, Jim. Uh, so I, I'm not sure, is, is this when I do my 10 minutes of prepared remarks or are you just asking me on that particular issue? Uh, go, yeah, I'd love to hear your remarks. <laughs> Okay, I thought I was going last, so I apologize, but um, that's fine. Whatever you would prefer for me to do. Go for it. Okay, all right. Um, okay, so I will. Uh, what I would say is I'll uh, address uh, some of the legal aspects in my prepared remarks, and then by all means, if we want to riff and during question and answer, I'm happy to go into a deeper dive on any of these kind of things. Uh, before I begin, uh, and just so you know, I did time these for 10 minutes, so I know it's 10. Uh, let me state that this presentation reflects my own personal views and does not necessarily represent the positions of the U.S. government, the U.S. Department of Defense, or any of its components. So the international security challenges here in East Asia are complex, particularly the ones in which maritime security and maritime law are intertwined. For matters involving international security, realists would say that states behave in furtherance of their national interests in their relations with other states. But in practice, not every state involved in maritime East Asia behaves in the same way or to the same degree in order to further its interests. And I'm going to focus my remarks on the behavior of the PRC. The PRC employs all instruments of its national power in a strategic, comprehensive, and strident manner in maritime East Asia with minimal to no accommodation to other states involved. And this approach has caused, as we see, significant concerns among other states, particularly in the context of maritime security and maritime law. So I will offer up three points to support this proposition. First, the PRC is the only claimant, not just in East Asia, but anywhere in the world, who asserts an absurd claim based on an ambiguous dash line that is completely unjustifiable under international law. The existence of this line is fairly well known for audience who track security developments in East Asia, but what cannot be understated is just how big of an obstacle China's insistence of that line as a legitimate claim is to any potential for real progress in managing and resolving the dispute. In 1947, at the end of World War II, a survey team from the Republic of China drew the predecessor of this line on a map when they returned to Taipei to brief their government's leadership. And Chris Chung, from, uh, I believe he's from Canada, did a great research piece on this a few years back uh, in which he went into the internal government archives there in Taipei and confirmed that the predecessor line was intended to summarize only a sovereignty claim to the islands located within the line 
and not a claim to any special status of the waters therein. But what I would describe as either historic revisionism or political alchemy, Beijing has attempted to transform this dashed line with a limited meaning and some sort of super claim in order to justify whatever China wants in the South China Sea and in total disregard of whatever international law allows coastal states to claim. The only place where you can find defenders of this dashed line, to my knowledge, is not surprisingly in China. In response, the Philippines brought a case against China before the arbitral tribunal in their own clause nine years ago, asserting in part that China's dashed line violated that body of international law. The tribunal exhaustively went through things, and they agreed with a well-reasoned 500-page opinion, uh, a large portion of which invalidated China's dashed line as a maritime claim. This decision was and continues to be binding on China as a matter of international law. Uh, yet China refuses to respect and abide by that decision and has never has taken active and persistent measures to delegitimize it. So more than six years has passed since that decision, and where are we in resolving the disputes? I would offer, and I would welcome discussion in the, in the question and answer, that all of the other South China Sea claimants would likely be willing to adopt a 200-mile nautical, uh, a 200 nautical mile belt of EEZ measured from their mainland coast, and then use the median line in those areas where there's less than 200 miles between 400 miles between. So China is the sole outlaw liar who continues to insist that areas should be shared where this unjustifiable dashed line overlaps with justifiable EEZs. So if we go back to contemporary negotiating theory, we know that a dispute is not going to be there's not going to be a bargainable solution when there's no zone of possible agreement. So that is where there's an overlap between what I think are acceptable options and what you think are acceptable options. And China's dashed line claim is solely responsible for eliminating the existence of any ZOPA in the South China Sea situation in dispute. My second point is the PRC has dedicated tremendous resources over the past few years to fortify its position and solidify its power in maritime East Asia to an unprecedented level. In the South China Sea, China is engaged in its massive land reclamation, what I describe as claymation in many states, because it's not re-anything. It's not returning to a status. It's something where islands didn't previously exist. China's, Beijing's intended purpose for these activities is unclear. Are they seeking to bolster their sovereignty claims? Are they seeking to assert new maritime claims? Or do they just not care about either, and they're focused solely on developing a strategic advantage of having forward outposts? from which to launch military operations to deter and intimidate other states. Regardless of their intended purpose or purposes, these Chinese-occupied features now exist. Beijing has emplaced highly capable military installations on several of these features. Beijing knows no other nation will attempt to knock China off of them, and China successfully changed the status quo to its advantage. In the South and East China Seas, both China has militarized its Coast Guard. Previously, Chinese officials would emphasize to other governments that China was not militarizing the South and East China Sea situations, and they would point to Beijing's deliberate use of white holes and not gray holes as a good faith measure. But over time, the narrative has become less convincing, as Beijing has changed the command and control, the domestic authority, and the operational capabilities of its Coast Guard. China established its Coast Guard in 2013, but then in 2018, China shifted its Coast Guard from the civilian control of the State Oceanic Administration to the People's Armed Police under the military command of the Central Military Commission. And over the past decade, China has dramatically increased the number of its ships and its Coast Guard fleet and built significantly larger white holes with advanced weapon systems that dwarf the gray hole navies of many other countries in East Asia, including other claimant states. In both bodies of these waters, China has also deployed its maritime militia. A decade ago, Beijing pushed another narrative that some of the questionable behavior from Chinese flag fishing boats and their crews was merely the unprompted actions of patriotic fishermen. I recall hearing across the table members of the PLA Navy saying, you must understand these fishermen view it as good luck to cross the bow of a warship. We have the same problem as you do, U.S. Navy. But thanks to the research by external scholars and to domestic websites in the PRC over the past decade, we now know this was also a false narrative. Many of the fishing boats and their crews are in fact mobilized as Chinese maritime militia who receive direction from the Chinese military and the Chinese Communist Party, who receive funding and training from them, and who are called upon to act in furtherance of China's strategic objectives. These militia forces overwhelm the law enforcement capacity of other claimant states in both the South and East China Seas, like the Philippines and Japan, and they also pose a risky wild card for causing potential collisions 
and loss of life with navies operating lawfully in the region. My third point is the PRC has sought to isolate bilateral negotiations as the only acceptable method of resolving any of its disputes in Maritime East Asia so that Beijing can leverage maximum power against smaller claimant states. International law, as reflected in the UN Charter, recognizes a number of peaceful means through which states may resolve their disputes with other states, including but not limited to negotiation, mediation, conciliation, arbitration, judicial settlement, and Security Council facilitation. But China refuses to consider any of these lawful means other than negotiations and insists that any negotiations must be bilateral in nature, even for disputes that involve more than two states, which is, under the Vienna Convention Law of Treaties, a legal impossibility. You can't bind third parties to a negotiation they weren't a party to. China has dismissed the use of international courts and tribunals to address any of these disputes, implying that these third-party dispute mechanisms are some way inappropriate. But China continues to nominate and campaign for its judges to serve as members of the ICJ and it lost the two judicial bodies with extensive experience in addressing and resolving territorial and maritime disputes. So curiously, such mechanisms for resolving international disputes peacefully are acceptable for China to judge other nations, but not for the international community of nations to judge China. China has also leveraged its special status as a permanent member of the UN Security Council with its veto power. Most recently in August of 2021, when India served as the rotating president of the Security Council and convened a meeting of the Security Council on maritime security, Beijing's representative at the meeting said, quote, the Security Council is not the right place to discuss the issue of the South China Sea, end quote. But the UN Charter expressly states that the Security Council has, quote, primary responsibility for the maintenance of international peace and security. China has also neutralized the potential for other South China Sea claimant states from developing any collective strength in the most appropriate regional form. Since its inception, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations has followed the ASEAN way of decision-making based on a consensus among its 10 member states. In recent years, a number of other countries have emphasized that ASEAN centrality is an essential element of maintaining international peace and security in East Asia. But Beijing has neutralized this system of ASEAN consensus and ASEAN centrality in several ways. It has co-opted its friends like Cambodia and Laos, thereby negating the potential for ASEAN consensus on any substantive matter, including maritime security challenges. Additionally, when Manila initiated its arbitration case nine years ago, Beijing engaged in a whispering campaign among the other ASEAN members that the Philippines was solely responsible for destabilizing relations within the region with this case, thereby creating a negative stigma for claimant states to pursue the lawful option of arbitration and judicial settlement. In the context of leveraging its relatively relative uh, power bilaterally, China has employed, employed both economic sticks and carrots towards other claimant states in maritime East Asia, to include punishing other claimant states economically for being too assertive in their territorial or maritime disputes with China, such as uh, rare earth minerals in Japan or uh, banana uh, imports for the Philippines, and while at the same time, China has sweetened the economic pot with other states through the Belt and Road Initiative and Belt and Silk Road to accommodate China's interests. Taken together, these three points show that other states are justified in their concerns about China's actions and intentions in Maritime East Asia. And that concludes my prepared presentation, and I look forward to any kind of questions or discussion on that. Thanks. John, that was a, a tour de force of, uh, I think, the, the situation around uh, China's influence on, on maritime law in the region. Uh, a absolutely um, masterful in terms of 10-minute ten, ten presentation. Very, very well done. Uh, Darshan, I wonder if you want to pick up on any threads that have been put out, uh, respond to any points, or if you have remarks that you've prepared, we'd love to, to hear them. Um, and, and we can then move on from there. Sure. Thank you, Jeff, and thank you to the Foundation and Institute for inviting me uh, here for this um, conference. Um, when we initially spoke, Jeff, you wanted me to sort of look at, provide a perspective from the region on maritime security and how other countries think about maritime security. And I just want to spend a few minutes on talking about the different perspectives on security itself. Um, I know in the last couple of panels, conversation on Quad and India and others have come up, and I'm happy to take that on during Q&A. Uh, but for my uh, time right now, I just want to uh, provide a perspective from smaller island states as well as regional, regional states that look at 
perhaps maritime security a little different than most others, essentially United States and a lot of its uh, partners. Uh, when we talk about maritime security from Washington's point of view and a lot of the bigger powers, it's essentially always shaped towards naval strategy. It is very much dominant and very much uh, forward thinking on what can the Navy do, how to protect naval assets, how to uh, essentially in terms of um, a very Navy and hard security military dominant conversation. But in the, from a regional perspective and from, from a small states and small littoral states point of view, maritime security is far wider and often on the non-traditional spectrum of it. It's about illegal fishing, it's about drug trafficking, it's about uh, uh, human smuggling, and most of all, climate change. If you go to a small island state and if you ask their um, a, a, a marine police or coast guards, one of the biggest national defense threat that the country faces, they will not say it's invasion by US or China, it'll always be climate change. So the definition of security itself is very different. So when Washington is going down to the region and talking about maritime security, but you're talking past each other on what constitutes security itself, I think there are some gaps um, uh, gaps in that. And most, and most of the small island states or even um, littoral states don't have a uh, don't have a navy, sizable navy. Essentially, mo most countries have a coast guard or marine police. As when it comes down to smaller, smaller island states, um, that's the first point on a different perspective on what constitutes maritime security. That it's not always about naval strategy, although that is a critical um, aspect of it. The second point I wanted to pick up was on from the conversation on maritime law and the, and and China's sort of behavior in the South China Sea and the disregard for international law. The nine dash line is, uh, is, essential, is, uh, is, is uh, definitely a disregard for international law and the PCA ruling that, that came up in 2016 that China disregarded was also not in line with, uh, with UNCLOS. But, but from a regional perspective and from other powers or other uh, littoral states perspective, China is not really the only country. China is certainly not the sole nation who disregards maritime law at that level. Let's go to the, uh, to the Indian Ocean, to the case of Diego Garcia, where United States has been, United States and United Kingdom has their uh, uh, biggest asset or biggest base in Diego Garcia in the middle of the Indian Ocean, which the sovereignty of it is contested by Mauritius. And, uh, and uh, there has been three rulings so far, and each of the UN rulings have um, ruled in favor of Mauritius saying that the United Kingdom illegally occupies the islands and so does the United States. Uh, both US and UK has refused to even acknowledge that verdict saying UN has no right or UN has no uh, sort of jurisdiction to rule on these matters. So it's not just China, it is, it is a great power trait or behavior where you disregard international law and international norms. So when Washington goes down to the region and and proposes the rules-based international order, it's essentially a conversation about which rules and whose order, because whether it, it's also a conversation about, I think, good power versus bad power. It's essentially saying that China is a bad power or US is a good power. But power itself will always cause friction. And I think that for smaller nations, it's about, it's, it's, or, or littoral states, it's, about, it's a question about, uh, it's not just China who's disregarding it, so are you, but where do we stand in this, in this conflict and what is in our national strategy and what is in our national interest? And I think this is somewhere there's a conversational or policy gap because Washington and its partners sometimes think that if we were to tell the region how blatantly disregard, uh, blatantly China disregards international norms, I'm certain that the region will understand how this is problematic. But the, but the issue is that the region is aware how both United States and China at times for their own national interests and benefit disregard international law and, law and international norms. International law and norms, maritime, maritime security, even with UNCLOS, which uh, US has not ratified, uh, is, is only imposed on smaller powers who do not have the military strength to essentially a, a challenge some of that. Um, and the third point I wanted to make was on a, on a different perspective of China. Um, in the South China Sea, China is the assertive uh, Navy, and, and I agree with a lot of the assessment that has come out from the last two days. It, it conflicts with interest uh, from, a bit, it conflicts with US interest, it conflicts with Indian interest in the Indian Ocean, with Japan, with Australia, 
and Chinese and Chinese maritime ambitions do conflict with a lot of the other powers in the in the region. But again, from a point of view outside of the Quad, outside of I, I would say um, you know perhaps littorals and again islands, China is not the only only country which is uh, which is problematic. Um, Take China out of the South China Sea, and in the, whether it is the Pacific or the Indian Ocean, China has not a single territorial dispute with anybody in the Pacific or the Indian Ocean. It's the United States, it's the United Kingdom, it's France, at times India, and it's partners. So it's China is the alternative, uh, alternative to a dominant power that many of the countries, many of the many of the littorals have had to live with with missing diplomatic presence as well. Solomon Islands came up yesterday, uh, the conversation about China building bases. But if you did an assessment on how China was able to do that or why China was able to do that, you'll, it'll, it'll be very easy to create that, uh, create the timeline in terms of for how long US has been missing from actual diplomatic conversation with many of these islands. When, when Secretary Blinken went to Fiji in, in February of 2020, it was after a gap of 37 years. And if Pacific is really a key area and a critical, critical arena, and I think, I think those, are the, those are some of the uh, uh, policy gaps in Washington that perhaps we, Canada can look at in terms of understanding, understanding the region, um, which comes to the, la comes to the last point, which is uh, the question of agency. Great power competition, there's always smaller, littoral, smaller neighbors who are always caught into that, into that act. Uh, but I think because of historically looking at it, again, coming back to, say, the naval strategy, why islands are important, island hopping, it was essential in, in US pushing back against Imperial Japanese Navy. And we, when we think about, say, whether it's Taiwan, whether it's China, in placing assets and geography and critical uh, geography across sea lines of communications, Islands come up as um, potential bases or 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 partners where which, who could host um, host whether it's U.S. or whether it is uh, Chinese interest and bases in the region, but but the problem between the last time, whether it's Cold War or or the Second World War, and now is that each of the islands are sovereign nations today, and they have their own own agency. Every littoral nation has their own agency, and their and their foreign policy choices, whether it, is in, whether it is good or bad for Washington, but it is their foreign policy, their economic choices, their military choices can have an impact on great power competition, which is why what the, the China um, security agreement with Solomon Islands had such a strong reaction from Washington. But because of the nature of great power competition historically, which has been decided between bigger powers and what is good for the region without considering the agency small island states or littoral nations can uh, can use there is a missing link somewhere today while again talking about it that your China and United States is talking about each other talking to each other walk t talking through perhaps a lot of the smaller islands a lot of the littoral nations who who do not have who do not want to pick a, cha, uh, uh, pick a side, and this came up in the ASEAN conversation yesterday, and it's true for the smaller islands as well. The the conversation on agency, what smaller island states or smaller nations want, would uh, matter in in moving forward in terms of a lot of the conversation. And bigger powers are going to have to get a little comfortable and a little used to taking this agency into consideration because you cannot today go up there and say that you've had long-standing partnership with us or we've been your key security player provider for the last 40 years and that's why we have been here before and that's why you should be a partner. China is a credible alternative and that is the view from the region that um, for both in the Pacific and the Indian Ocean and, 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 and Southeast Asia as well as has been pointed out, China is an alternative and is a, is a country that a lot, of, a lot of the littorals and small island states are willing to, uh, to work with and, and figure out their balance in that. And, and forcing, forcing down a narrative of rules-based international order where United States and its partners are not abiding by them themselves is not really uh, been that convincing or, 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 or effective to a lot of the smaller island states and, and partners in the region. And I just wanted to give this as an alternative viewpoint from the region where, uh, where smaller states, littorals, actually really respect 
rules-based international order and multilateral systems, but, um, but agree that neither United States nor, nor, nor China abides by either. So it's not a conversation about one is good, one is bad. It's to say big powers will impose on us and they will disregard whenever it's convenient for them. So what is it in for me and what part should I choose? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm, I'm aware that the, the previous speakers will wa want to have responses and some chance for interaction between panels, but uh, let's move to our final pre uh, presenter who's been waiting patiently. Uh, Eureka, um, what, what can you show us with respect to how, how Japan views some of these issues, in particular the application of, of uh, maritime law around certain aspects of, of territorial issues, and, and perhaps give us a, a, an insight into how Japan sits in the broader kind of regional context of maritime security and maritime law. I know you have some slides. Uh, if we could get those up uh, in order um, to, to demonstrate them to the audience. And, and then over to you for your presentation. Thank you again. Thank you, Jeff. Um, so first, um, let me start with thanking the Institute for Peace and Security and Asia Pacific Foundation and organizers uh, for having me in this important forum. So I do have a slide, so let me share that with you. Uh, in the next uh, 10, or 10, 10 minutes or so, uh, I'd like to talk about uh, Japan's situation uh, concerning the maritime security. And I'd like to briefly mention uh, on recent ICJ judgment. Um, I, I study international law, so I will start, stick to uh, the legal uh, aspects uh, of the situation. So uh, Japan has a unique uh, policy uh, on, on maritime and law, and uh, first it limits its domestic jurisdiction on EZ and continental shelf uh, to the median line where there is an opposite state. And as you can see, Japan is surrounded by a number of countries, uh, Russia, uh, South Korea, North Korea, China, uh, Taiwan, and uh, potentially there's a, there's a novel of, of it, the United States. Uh, and we, we do have the, the Philippines uh, uh, as a neighbor. Uh, so um, we do have a number of uh, states uh, and its geographical uh, situation is pretty complicated. And then we have uh, Okinotorishima, which is a small island uh, and uh, it has uh, a, you know, a, a vast uh, space of EZ and continental shelf. Uh, it is located uh, within the midst of a uh, first island chain and second island chain. So uh, China and the Republic of Korea uh, started to claim that uh, this island does not enjoy the status of uh, uh, an island uh, which generates IEZ and continental shelf. Now, um, I assume that uh, the audience may not be able to see uh, the text of this uh, you know, uh, slide. Uh, it shows the, the um, the text of UNCLOS, United Nations on of on the Con United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea, and uh, it provides rights and obligation of the coastal state with it within the EZ. It basically, said that the coastal state has the sovereign rights uh, within its own EZ. Now, excuse me. And then, uh, what if there's an overlap with the the, the uh, other states? It says, well, it doesn't say uh, in Korea, but uh, we understand that uh, there's the over, if there's an overlap of the maritime entitlement, then, then the both states have the equal rights until the area has been delimited. Now, there has been an issue with China and Japan um, where China started to, uh, you know, establish uh, these oil rigs uh, within uh, the East China Sea. And as you can see, it is located carefully located uh, to, to, to the Chinese side of the median line. However, it is still uh, within Japanese potential uh, continental shelf area, so that Japan has been claiming that uh, it is contrary to international law. Now, uh, excuse me. Now, I mean, uh, the UNCLOS provides uh, that uh, until the delimitation is done by the agreement, uh, the, the, the coastal state is entitled to, uh, excuse me, the, so the coastal state is obliged uh, not to jeopardize or hamper the reaching of the final agreement. And uh, it is considered that uh, the, the establishment of such 
uh, oil rigs uh, that could create uh, permanent uh, and physical change to the marine environment uh, could be violation of that obligation. Uh, second, uh, we, we, let's look at the re regime of islands. Now, I, again, uh, the, the, the text might be too small, but let me uh, read it out. Uh, now, Article 121 of UNCLOS provides that an island is naturally formed area of land surrounded by water, which is above water at high tide. And uh, it says that except as provided for in paragraph three, uh, the island enjoys uh, not only territorial sea and continuous zone, but also the e 200 nautical mile to EZ and the continental shelf that could be potentially extend beyond 200 nautical mile if there's a natural prolongation. However, paragraph three says that uh, rocks which cannot sustain human habitation or economic life of their own shall have no exclusive economic zone on continental shelf. Now, there's a de debate uh, concerning the you know, relations between paragraph one, which decides on, which provides on an island, and rocks, uh, which provides uh, under paragraph three. But uh, uh, both ICJ and uh, Annex 7 Tribunal, uh, tri Arbitral Tribunal, uh, on South China Sea case uh, held that they should be read in together. So uh, there's a maritime feature that is above high tide. Uh, uh, and uh, if that feature satisfies the conditions of paragraph three, then uh, that feature does not enjoy EZ and continental shelf. Now, uh, concerning the Okinawa Torishima, well, it, it's a small island, uh, but um, if you apply this provision, uh, I think it's possible, not because I'm a Japanese, but um, I, I mean, it could be, pos it is possible to justify uh, its, uh, you know, maritime entitlement under paragraph one. Uh, it, it totally depends on the interpretation of the human habitation or economic life of their own. Uh, and uh, there, there's a number of plans uh, to use uh, the Okinawa Torishima uh, in, in various purposes. So, you know, if you could enjoy the economic life of their own, then I just, you know, it, it, it enjoys the status of island. However, uh, we are looking at, you know, uh, foreign vessels, uh, you know, conducting uh, within the EZ of Okinawa Torishima, uh, mostly from China. So if you look at this uh, map, uh, you know, the pink dots, excuse me, this, I hope that, this, as you know, dot shows, you know, you, you are looking at Okinawa Torishima uh, at the uh, uh, right uh, hand, and uh, the China, the pink dot shows uh, Chinese survey vessels uh, within the Japanese EZ. And I'll skip the details, but basically, if you would like to do the, you know, marine scientific research or uh, the expo exploration of uh, the natural resources, you need to have the consent of the, of the coastal state. Uh, however, uh, those vessels, uh, you know, do not obtain a consent or uh, they are acting beyond uh, what Japan has agreed. And uh, when Japan Coast Guard, uh, you know, the law enforcement agency Japan, you know, tries to stop them, uh, they simply ignore uh, the warning. That's one thing. Now, uh, next scenario, the possible scenario uh, is uh, the the ex escalation of this situation, uh, because uh, you know China has now a new law, uh, Chinese Coast Guard law, and uh, basically it you know specifies the mandate of Chinese Coast Guard or CCG. And if you look at Article 20, Twelve. Uh, the mandate of the CCG includes uh, the, to manage and protect maritime boundaries. And uh, I think uh, that the maritime boundary means the, the, the outer, outer edge of the EZ and continental shelf within the, the East China Sea. So that would cover, uh, you know, the maritime area uh, of uh, Japan's EZ continental shelf. And uh, the, also the CCG Act uh, says that, that 
the mandate of CCG include to monitor and inspect activities, including exploration and development of marine mineral resources for marine scientific researches within its mandate to use the marine areas. Now, uh, the exploration uh, or and development of marine mineral resources and marine scientific researches are, you know, exclusively reserved to the coastal state. So, uh, you know, if the if it is about the EZ that belongs to Japan, then uh, that it's, that is not within their mandate. I mean, CCG's mandate. However, you know. If the maritime area surrounding Kochino Torishima is high seas, then uh, you know uh, CCG has the mandate to come with those ships and uh, you know uh, monitor those activities. All right. So uh, we, I talked about uh, China, but North Korea is also you know uh, doing the missiles uh, you know uh, activities, and uh, we are looking at you know North Korean missiles coming into Japan's EEZ, which could potentially, you know, harm uh, Japanese uh, activities as well. Now, finally, uh, let me briefly mention the, that the ICJ now had a really interesting and important case. And I will skip all the details, but basically it said, it said that, you know, um, Colombia's uh, harassing, uh, you know, act activities against uh, Nicaraguan's uh, vessels, uh, you know, are basically the violation of Nicaragua's uh, sovereign rights within its EEZ. And uh, I, I think this case really deserves a close study because it, you know, it really resembles uh, the situation in East China Sea and uh, South China Sea. I, I also think that it is important to, that we do, do the study of uh, you know, other areas, uh, not only the Caribbean Sea, but also the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, which also have, you know, the regional maritime power uh, and uh, the geogra geographical ge geography is uh, somewhat, uh, you know, common to the situation in East Asia and South China, uh, South China Sea. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so a lot of information uh, on strategy, on maritime law, uh, on exclusive economic zones, on the behavior of different states across what is the, the Indo-Pacific maritime region. Uh, I'm aware that as the speakers spoke, they raised issues that perhaps they might ha want to have an internal discussion about. So I offer the opportunity just to go back around maybe and spend one minute if anyone has a response or a, an issue they'd like to raise uh, around um, any of the other presenters' points and maybe try to encourage a little bit of crosstalk here, uh, moving off notes and maybe having a, a little bit of more uh, um, an integrated discussion. Jim, I wonder if, if after hearing that those three really rich presentations, if you have any further thoughts you'd like to elaborate on. And then I'd really like to hear, uh, John, some of your responses to Darshana's points in, in particular. Uh, and maybe we can tease out that discussion a little bit more and, and, see, and see where they take us. At the same time, for those that are interested in raising questions, um, why don't you go ahead and start to queue up behind the microphones. We have about 15 minutes left, and so we do have a really great opportunity for, for good discussion moving forward. Jim, do you want to kick that off? Yes, thank you so much, uh, Jeff. Uh, I was uh, most uh, fascinated by Darshana's uh, uh, comments, and uh, one point I would uh, highlight, and that's that uh, above and beyond the South China Sea, uh, a major area of contention is near Taiwan, and it involves the so-called Senkaku or Daiutai uh, islets, uh, rocky outcrops, uh, which uh, are very much a part of uh, Japan's maritime uh, arena, but are claimed by China. And the Chinese have conducted what I would call a carborundum approach, where you wear down your opponent by constant uh, interventions with literally hundreds of overflights. Uh, the Japanese, I believe, and Eureka Sign can probably correct me on this, I think probably upwards of 450 times they scrambled their fighters to uh, ward off uh, uh, Chinese uh, overflights of uh, the Senkaku or Daiutai uh, cluster of islets, and similarly with uh, maritime penetration. So this is another uh, flashpoint uh, above and beyond the complexities of the South China Sea. Great. 
Thank you. Uh, do you want to respond to that, don't you? No? Okay. John, uh, any, any points that you heard of interest over the last couple uh, presentations you'd like to, to respond to? Sure. Uh, thanks. So uh, on Darshana's uh, first point about uh, the differing definitions of, of maritime security among states or from their, I don't want to put words in their mouth, uh, but from different perspectives, uh, where you sit depends upon, where you stand depends upon where you sit. Uh, I fully agree with her uh, in that, um, you know, oftentimes it, it, we, especially like at the Marshall Center where I teach now in Europe, as well as the Asia Pacific Center in Hawaii, making sure that there's a common understanding across the table in discussions with uh, representatives from a number of countries to not assume that you look at maritime security the same way every other country does. And so uh, a lot of these countries don't have navies, as she said, some of the smaller countries, and their Coast Guard is their, uh, their uh, maritime force or they may have a Navy and their Navy does a purely Coast Guard type function. So uh, I think it's mindful to meet people where they are, meet countries where they are. And I think from uh, at least the U.S. military perspective, U.S. government perspective, one of the efforts has been more for the Coast Guard to get involved in engagement in the region to the extent that they can, U.S. Coast Guard. Because reality is the number of the countries in the region, that while they, they respect the U.S. Navy, they know what the U.S. Navy is capable of, they really want to engage and learn from the U.S. Coast Guard because of the vast experience in boarding operations, for example. Um, so I agree with her on that. On the second point, uh, I, I, I guess the concern I have, and I'm not speaking for the government here, the U.S. government, is that uh, it, it would be quick, uh, easily dismissible to say uh, because the U.S. does not have a perfect record on international law, which I acknowledge, therefore the U.S. cannot speak out, the U.S. cannot take actions. Uh, on ma matters in East Asia, whether it be free navigation operations or whatever. So, uh, and that, uh, therefore, we shouldn't necessarily look so as closely at to China's behavior. Um, because I really think, at, at, at this point, uh, a number of the things that the Chinese are doing, uh, not just disregard of what was clearly a binding ruling as a matter of international law, um, but the Nine Dash Line continuing to do that, the island building uh, at the level that it was done, the use of the maritime militia, the use of gray hulls, uh, to intimidate uh, its neighbors, all of these kind of things, um, and a, a really no good faith desire to resolve any of these disputes. Uh, let's be honest. The only boundary dispute, maritime boundary dispute that they did was in uh, 2000 with Vietnam and the Gulf of Tonkin. Um, and, you know, I, I, while I agree that the Mauritius case right going on right now uh, is uh, hurts the U.S. credibility, in my personal opinion, um, on how it's going to come out on that. I know that the Mauritian government has has offered to let the U.S. maintain its military base in Diego Garcia, uh, but I, I think the jury's still out on what's going to happen there. I don't have any inside knowledge on it. But regardless, to therefore, because of that one case, therefore, uh, we and no one is allowed to raise issues of what China's behavior is, seems to suggest that, uh, well, for example, the U.S. has had over 20 cases that have, that have gone to the ICJ, uh, including one involving a maritime dispute between the U.S. and Canada, which pretty much the U.S. lost or it wasn't as favorable to the U.S. in the Gulf of Maine case, and yet the U.S. respects the rule. Um, and the U.S. has a great working alliance with Canada. Uh, and, um, you know, the U.S. has a number of boundary agreements, maritime boundary agreements with other neighbors. And, you know, a, a perfect example of the concern uh, to kind of lump these in together is I remember uh, back when I was working in, in Secretary of Defense's office, we had a tabletop exercise with the Canadians on maritime security. And the scenario involved some sort of terrorist threat that was happening uh, um, north of Alaska in the Arctic. And the situation, well, it was in, uh, the situation was happening in a disputed area and uh, in which was overlapping claims by both countries. And that never came up at all in the discussion. Uh, Canada and the U.S. were closely aligned trying to figure out how do we counter this threat and there was no discussion whatsoever of that. Uh, I cannot say the same that is happening in the East China Sea and South China Sea if a terrorist situation or an IUU fishing or uh, uh, a proliferation of uh, 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 weapons of mass destruction on a ship coming from North Korea, there's not going to be that cooperation uh, because there is going to be posturing and a lot of that posturing is going to be coming from Beijing. So I think that's that would be my concern of oversimplifying and say, because of the Mauritius UK case, Therefore, the U.S. is not allowed to say anything. Um, and I think what I would agree is that's more of while the U.S. might have a credibility issue uh, because of that issue of, of Mauritius, um, it's all the more important for other countries to be speaking out. 
And what I would applaud is a number of the Southeast Asian countries starting to issue these demarches that happened in the past uh, two years, which are starting to sound more and more similar to each other. Whether Malaysia, Indonesia, uh, Vietnam, Philippines, their uh, diplomatic demarches in which they are saying that the nine dash line violates international law, that these actions that China is engaging in and other countries eating disease violates international law. And my hope is, is there's going to be some way that those claimant states, so not all 10 ASEAN uh, member states are, are claimant states, that those non, uh, the ones that actually have a claim will start speaking more with one voice and they'll be able to leverage bargaining power that way. That's my perspective. Thanks. Thanks, John. Darshan, I wonder if, if you can pick up on any, uh, any of those points. I also want to throw out a question to, to you and to, to the rest of the, the panelists about the potential of a code of conduct around the South China Sea in particular. Um, you know, ongoing negotiations between ASEAN, between China about finding a set of rules around, finding a set of, of conditions that could allow for a, a decrease of tensions within the South China Sea. Of course, then it runs up against international law. So when you think about a potential solution to the geopolitics on the one side of a, an agreed set of, of norms and values on, on a code of conduct, uh, that could benefit many of the regional actors and, and actually increase their agency with respect to their, their near abroad around the maritime issues. How does that butt up against um, international law and how would that be conceived within international law? And maybe that's also a, a case or a question for you, uh, Eureka-san, to think about, is there a potential to come up with a, a code of conduct for activities in the maritime realm that could supersede or, or over, overlap or, or, or even support international law in a way that provides greater uh, opportunity for regional actors, small states, underrepresented players in the region to have a greater voice within what essentially is, in many instances, a, a great power competition on the maritime realm and a very narrow set of laws around, um, uh, around uh, maritime security. Sure. Um, um, thank you. Uh, John, I completely agree with you that, um, you know, just because there are disputes elsewhere, you should not be speaking up or upholding the rules-based international order or in national norms and rules. But uh, the point I was making was essentially because within the Indo-Pacific, there is the, the narrative, right, that it knew the Indo-Pacific should be based on rules-based international order, but it's not necessarily accepted by all because they do see a realm of hypocrisy in that, in, in that you know only one country is not abiding by rules and the other set are, so you should, the whole conversation, we had a conversation yesterday about democracy versus autocracy, you know, a good state versus bad state, a good power versus bad power. Power, in a sense, will cause friction. China's ambition is to be a maritime power, and it is bound to cause that friction with its neighbors, with the United States, with Australia, with Japan, with India, with anybody who, who Beijing sees as sitting in its, its, its slots or around, it, around its slots. But the point I was trying to make was that it's not so, it's not a binary conversation. It's not clear cut that for Washington to go to its partners and say, uh, that you know, this is a complete disregard for international rules and norms. And there's also a lot of historical baggage, right, that Washington carries with a lot of its smaller players, whether it's nuclear tests, whether it's cold, uh, whether it's the Second World War in the Pacific. I'm sure you're aware of those those concerns. Uh, their concerns even with with Japan in terms of dumping the uh, nuclear waste water from Fukushima into the Pacific, into the Pacific, where you know Tokyo says that uh, it's 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 not harmful. And they said, well, if it's not harmful, why in the Pacific do it in Sea of Japan? Japan. So there are these conversations which essentially linger on from historical and political baggage in a way that China has not had. So there is an alternative view from smaller states, from littoral states, who's not had that historical at a national level or, or a political level, uh, you know, work through that baggage with China. So who see China as an alternative player in a region where some of its bigger partners have been missing. But Again, to come down to in terms of even if I, I mentioned that the U.S. has not ratified don't clause, but even if U.S. has not ratified don't clause, U.S. is one of the biggest uh, observer of, of own clause and operates at, in, in seas within the norms and, and, and kind of uh, in law uh, accordance uh, uh, to own clause. And I think it's a debate more a domestic debate rather than at an international court of uh, uh, law conversation. So. I, so my point is essentially, yes, absolutely. It's not that, you know, just because of Chago's U.S. should not speak up on South China State. It absolutely must. But there has to also be room for others in the region to to kind of voice and have that empathy that, you know, not everybody sees it as binary and not everybody sees it as, you know, U.S. is the better 
power to work with, and China is not because of because of the other things that I had mentioned. On the code of conduct, I mean, in South China, it's been ongoing for a while, and, and it is an issue in terms of bilateral negotiations. There's a, it is a conversation between a bigger power and a smaller power, and there's always, in those conversations, one, power, one country always holds bigger chips or better uh, uh, chips in that. And I think in bilateral negotiations, usually is, it's, it's problematic. But there are cases, just John mentioned, where neighbors have resolved disputes. Uh, India and Bangladesh have, have, have resolved disputes recently in 2015 coming out of uh, the International Court of Justice. So there are definitely examples of those. But code of conduct in the South China Sea, because of the number of players in there, by the way, even Taiwan has the exact same claim of the nine dash line as China does. So, so there are there. So, in because of the number of players involved in it, I think I think it'll be a, a bigger conversation. And to your point, should there be a set of rules or a conversation on a code of conduct at sea to minimize friction or accidental uh, uh, accidents at sea? There are. I think you know you ask. Navy, there are established customary rules of behavior and norms at sea that most navies follow, and and those those have been established. But territorial disputes is something you know when it comes down to sovereignty, it's always a much more complicated conversation. And you can have powers who will observe that law in every other part of uh, the ocean, but when it comes down to that sovereignty issue, it is very much a political and issue of national interest. So. Code of conduct has been going on for a very long time, ASEAN. Even after, even after kind of PCA ruling, you know, a lot of countries expected Philippines to double down on that, but Philippines did not, as much as probably others thought it would. The whole phone ops uh, exercises, which is all again within realm of of code of conduct and international law, but uh, that's an co ongoing conversation, and it has to happen between China and, and and the ASEAN partners. And I don't see this being resolved anytime soon, as much as as is the case with most disputes with sovereignty issues, especially in a geography as critical as the South China Sea. So we're up against, we're up against the end of our allotted time, Eureka Sun. I'd like to give you the, the last word to maybe address any of these issues, whether it's with respect to alternative approaches to managing maritime relations, uh, developing norms that could, uh, that, that could be overlaid to international law, that maybe the, the, the inappropriateness of even considering using norms to direct state behavior in the maritime realm. Any ideas or thoughts that you would like to conclude with uh, on this panel? Thank you. So I, I do have two points. Um, one is on the code of conduct. I completely, with, uh, I completely agree with Darshana um, that uh, you know, there are other norms already established. So the, the, I mean, the contents of the code of conduct, you know, uh, could be, uh, uh, how do you say that? Uh, they have been negotiating uh, the, this intri instrument so for a while, uh, and uh, there are so many variations. Uh, but basically, they are talking about the prohibition of use of force, you know, the safety of the use of sea, and the you know the re reduction of the risk of the conflict, and so on. And those you know contents are provided in other instruments that are legally binding, including UNCLOS. Uh, United Nations Charter and Solas uh, and Kurlek and so on. Um, so, you know, um, the, uh, so it, 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 you know, it's important to have the maritime confidence building measures, uh, and code of conduct could be the part of you know the creation of such trust. But uh, we do have international norms mm -hmm. that regulate you know those that the same contents uh, with the potential code of conduct. Uh, the other point I th that I'd like to make is uh, that uh, we should look at the norm setting uh, development uh, in in other uh, instruments, and uh, we have uh, you know we, we uh, the the not only ASEAN but also the United States and European Union has you know is declared its policies uh, on uh, Indo Pacific, uh, and that could you know potentially. E e e counter the development of BRI, or I mean, or it could be, you know, in a cooperative uh, solution, it could, you know, build a cooperation with uh, China on the development, development of infrastructure. So we, we are now looking at, uh, you know, different policies and, uh, and you know, principles uh, concerning the development of uh, the region. Uh, and uh, that could be, you know, also a part of the maritime security. Thank you. Panelists, thank you so much for your contributions and the, the incredibly thoughtful, sorry, 
Oh, excuse me, yeah? Uh, we, yeah, no problem. Yeah, let's take a question. Do we have a time for a question? I, I, yes, a short question and a short answer. <laughs> sure. Um, thanks, Jeffrey. Catherine Ruiz Avila, I'm with the Australian High Commission here in Ottawa. I guess I just wanted to quickly um, pick up on something that uh, Dashana, you had, had said, and I guess I don't feel quite so ready to give up on the capacity of international law to resolve some of these really sticky, tricky territorial disputes. Um, Australia was subject to a compulsory concili conciliation process brought under UNCLOS, the first process in back in 2016, which was brought by Timor-Leste, for those of you who don't know, one of the smallest and newest nations in the world. And that, even though Australia did actually contest um, the competence, the jurisdiction of the commission, you know, we, we lost that argument and submitted in good faith. And actually that process was able to result in a successful treaty that did delimit our maritime boundaries it did settle a very long-running and difficult dispute. Um, and we hope set a good precedent. So I guess the kind of question to the panel, you can just do a thumbs up or down or make a comment, uh, is really, what, was that kind of a one-off? Or, or are you still opt optimistic or pessimistic that um, there is scope to use maritime law and UNCLOS in particular to mediate res uh, rule on and then be respected to resolve current and future disputes. Thank you. Great question. Uh, John, I see you have a finger up. You want to take a crack at that? What I would say is my argument would be that is the only way that these are going to get resolved. Uh, and what I, why I say that, you look at examples of Bangladesh and uh, Myanmar and Bangladesh and India, as, as, uh, that, let me put it this way. Is there anything that Beijing is going to say to Manila that convinces them that their claim is superior? No. Is there anything Manila is going to be able to say to Beijing? No. Is there anything that Tokyo is going to say to Beijing? No. Anything Beijing is going to say to Tokyo? No. So many of these claims, I think that the only way they'll be resolved is by a third party. Because the politicians in each of these government systems have promised their people for generations that this island belongs to them or this water space belongs to them. And India lost against Bangladesh, uh, and they said, you know what, we let the system play it out, uh, we're going to respect the rule. So a similar kind of situation as to what Australia did with Timor West, I think, otherwise, you're never going to, let's be honest, we're never going to resolve any of these disputes through negotiation. Um, and what I would offer is, if, if each of the countries had a belt of 200 mile EEZ, and then all of those small islands were enclaved by 12 mile territorial sea, and then they brought in an arbitration panel and said, all right, go through all of these and identify who has a superior claim to them. Uh, and you can also include issues of equity, as in kind of dividing them up equally. And the ones that you're already occupying, you maybe get to keep those. Uh, but otherwise, everybody uh, would benefit from the certainty of that. And you would be able to patrol when it comes to, for example, IU fishing. You don't have all of this ungoverned space in which it's unclear who's going to uh, govern that area and therefore the IU fishermen's win. So that's my, that's my commercial for uh, third party dispute mechanism. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Um, no, absolutely agree with you uh, in terms of international law, definitely, I think is the way forward. UNCLOS provides that umbrella and the structure, and then it should remain there. But, uh, and exactly what you said from Australia and Timor Leste, or India, India, Bangladesh, Bangladesh, Myanmar, Bangladesh, Maldives, there have been cases across the world. But, the, but I, I suppose the issue with South China Sea is in all of the other examples we've cited, it's essentially been bilateral. So it comes down to a uh, decision at a political level that kind of, you know, the situation between the two partners at that point and saying, okay, this is something we are willing to work on in delimitation right now. Kenya and Somalia is hearing, there's a case around that. Um, but with the issue with South China Sea is multiple players. It's six nations, and the, the focus is on the dispute between five countries and, and Beijing, but there's also overlapping dispute between and amongst the claimants themselves. So even if you were to say that we've resolved this with Beijing, there'll still be overlapping disputes amongst the, the many claimants. And I think that's what, that's what is complicated with the South China Sea, that it's not a bilateral 
uh, dispute only between two countries. It's actually overlapping claims amongst six nations, and it did not really flare up until 2012 after Scarborough Shoal really, you know, at the, at the time that happened was because when the dispute was between small, two smaller neighbors, nobody really had the capacity or were acting in a way that threatens someone else's sovereignty or going into each other's easy. But with China, that has happened. And I think it's really, you know, spiraled out of, out of a bilateral territorial dispute. So Absolutely, it is maritime law, UNCLOS, UN, ICJ, advisory opinions. I think those are, these are the methods and frameworks to go forward. But it also means that each of the countries involved in, in this has to agree to that process, right? Because there's no way to implement this and there's no way to force anybody to, you know, accept that. So let's just hope that the countries involved in the South China Sea dispute will take lessons from resolution of disputes mm -hmm. through maritime law across the world and will come to solution which is a little difficult given competing maritime ambitions, but I'll end it there. We're going to have to leave it there. I know there's a lot more to say. I told you this was a big topic, a lot to cover, and I think we covered a lot of ground today. And I'll thank all of the panelists for their contributions to what was an incredibly rich discussion, touching on strategy and law and territorial disputes and EEZs and, and all of these dispute mechanisms. This is an incredibly, incredibly important topic. Thank you, uh, and join me in thanking the panelists. Thank you for those that attended virtually uh, in different time zones. Thank you for getting up early, staying up late, and, and uh, joining us uh, as you did. Great. Goodbye.